Thanks for having me here today. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about the data analysis tools for JWST, but I'm also going to spend a fair amount of time talking about how those tools came to be. So that's the second part of this title, right? It's a confluence of academia, NASA, and open source. And if you look carefully at these titles I've shown on here for myself, it basically channels those three areas. So if at some point of this talk you sort of start asking yourself, is he representing AstroPi or Space Telescope or a researcher, don't worry, you're living my day job. That's what I ask myself all the time. So it's okay if you find that confusing. So with that in mind, let me dive right in and start by sort of describing some of the star players here um, in this talk. So the starting point is, of course, JWST itself. So JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, is essentially this best thought of as the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. Can I actually get a show of hands who knows what the Hubble Space Telescope is? Okay, good. That was what I was hoping for. Uh, so JWST is the successor to Hubble. It has not launched yet. It's currently scheduled to launch in March 2021. Uh, and as you might imagine, that presents some interesting challenges for user interaction that I'll dwell on a lot more later on in the talk. I, but I want to emphasize also that JWST is a big deal in many different ways. It is one of the largest scientific projects ever done, and it's certainly the largest astronomy has ever seen. Uh, it's a, basically a football field size uh, bag of potato chips launched into space on a rocket that then has to align itself to sort of nanometer level accuracy once it's gone deep into space, right? So you can imagine how that's hard to do, uh, and in fact, that's why it's such a large and expensive project. Uh, but, as a result, that makes it an incredibly versatile thing, right? It has four scientific instruments with 15 different modes, 50 filters, and sort of hundreds of documented scientific use cases. It's a very general purpose tool. So that's good because it allows a lot of astronomers to do a lot of amazing things like discover the first stars, um, you know, find exoplanets that might be Earth-like, we'll see. Uh, but in the end, it also means the thing is incredibly complicated. Right? That's the point of this diagram, is not for you to understand anything that's on there, but that this just one little part of starting up the observatory when it sort of first is launched has this incredibly complicated flow diagram because of all these modes and things that can be changed. Right? So that's, that ends up being a huge challenge on the data analysis tool side, the, the, the subject of this talk, because there's so many different options, so many knobs to turn, widgets to set up, and all that sort of thing. So it ends up meaning that we have to figure out how to account for all of these hundreds of scientific use cases. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that happens as we go forward. Um, before, before I take the next step, though, I want to make sure I make it clear uh, the, what the Space Telescope Science Institute is. So that's where I work. Uh, and it's going to be relevant later on in the talk when I talk about how our development process operates. So Space Telescope is the institution that will be operating JWST, both the sort of mission control kind of thing and the scientific planning where we decide who gets how much time, essentially. Uh, and we do that because we've long done this for the Hubble Space Telescope. This is, it was the original Science Operations Center, and it's been that way since Hubble was launched, essentially. Uh, but the curious thing about it in, in, th in that context is that it's basically a very mixed bag of people who are much more scientists on the research side and engineers who are software developers like probably many of you are in this room. Um, and what that ends up meaning is that it's a unique place that has this interaction between scientists and engineers in a large mission-like format that's rather unusual. It's probably more comparable to like a national lab in some ways. So the context in which all of this is being developed is in that context. And that'll, again, become relevant in a little while. All right. But the actual subject of this talk, as the beginning of the title says, is the data analysis tools. So that's actually a phrase that probably means completely different things to everyone in this room. Uh, so I want to clarify what that means to an astronomer, or at least to a space astronomer. Um, data analysis tools are basically the things that come after the automated data processing steps. So you look at some beautiful image of some nebula that you want to do some scientific experiment on, that the light from that nebula comes into JWST, that gets recorded by the instruments, downlinked to Space Telescope, um, and then it passes through an automated pipeline that does all kinds of calibrations and things that have taken, you know, literally over a decade to establish as actually working. Um, and in the end, they all end in this archive, right? But, that, but all of that happens automatically, right? The pipeline is actually a pipeline in the sense of it just runs. And in principle, nobody has to manually do anything to run, to run the pipeline. So the, coming out the bottom of that, at the end of the archive, are the data analysis tools. So the thing I'm talking about are the things that actually require scientific intervention or sort of human interaction, if you prefer. 
Uh, now that's a very fuzzy line, right? As you'll see, some of the things I'm going to be showing are, are not really you know, necessarily things that truly require human interaction every step. They really require human setup and can't be automated as well. And indeed, some parts of the pipeline are sort of data analysis tools because people want to go back and fiddle with them after the fact. But this, it's still a useful separation to make that the pipeline is the part that you really more or less can automate and the data analysis tools are the things where you really have to think about the user experience because you actually have users. It's not just running on a computer that you can hopefully ignore. Uh, so that's what the data analysis tools are, right? That's the core thing I'm talking about here. Um, on the, the left of the slide, you can see a list of some of the key elements of these data analysis tools. I'm going to go through several of these in turn in a little while, but I also want to highlight the thing on the right, the much more haphazard-seeming uh, chart that shows all of the different ways just within the sort of um, JWST Space Telescope ecosystem, different pieces of these uh, software tools interact with each other. Right, so even though I'm going to pre present a few specific items, um, in the end, there's really a whole ecosystem even within the astronomy community, much less the wider ecosystem that you all represent. Um, right, then the, the last thing I want to check on first, though, is that uh, how many of you in this room are either astronomers or astrophysicists or, you know, you work regularly with astronomers or something like that? Okay, that's what I figured, yeah. It's not by no means the majority. So, so I should prime you all to understand sort of the, the astronomer way of thinking and how it inter interacts well with Python and the, the coding community. So uh, this, is, this is data from a survey that was done four years ago, I guess now. Um, but the core point is astronomers have a very special place to hold, or at least a rather relatively unique thing to hold in that almost all of them code. Right, almost something like what, 89% of them write their own code to do their own science. Right now, they often also use other people's code, although shockingly, a third of them claim they don't use anybody else's code. Um, but you know, that's what they believe. Let's just leave it at that. Um, but nonetheless, that's how it is. And the point is, most of, they have that in their mindset. Right, that that they actually don't. That, that they write all of their code and that they are, they're sort of a vehicle unto themselves. By contrast, if you look at the write chart, uh, about 8% of them believe that they actually have training in writing software. Right, so they're, they're essentially, they represent the sort of, in some ways, the, the, the stereotype of the, the scientist who's like, oh yeah, that's easy enough, I'll figure that out. Now, this is a broad brush, right? Lots of astronomers do not take that attitude. But, but they're, they're a unique community in that they do a lot of coding without a lot of background in coding. So that's the place we're coming from here, uh, and, that, and might be unusual to some of you out in, the, out in the audience who aren't used to working with a community like that that knows code really well, but doesn't really know code the way people who learn code know it. Um, but nonetheless, or perhaps, you know, in some ways causally connected, uh, Python has ended up being the code of choice that astronomers are now using. So again, as of four years ago, it had already become the single most popular programming language for uh, astronomers, the vast majority of whom do in fact write their own software for their own science. Um, and that was not, that was a sea change, right? If we'd done this five years ago, there would have been a relatively small fraction that are using Python. So there's been a, a huge shift in the last five to 10 years. And I think we really have this room in some sense, or at least the people who have been in this room in the past, to thank for that. Because the core element here is that the Python scientific software ecosystem has met the needs that the astronomers have. Even that 33% that think they don't ever use anyone else's code, uh, some fraction of them are using Python and they're clearly using other people's code now. Um, I, I should clarify, of course, that the causality here is a little bit circular because actually the sort of ahead of the curve, if you like, astronomers have been very actively involved in developing some of this ecosystem. So um, Space Telescope was actually involved in helping develop some of the precursors to NumPy, all that sort of thing. But the point is it wasn't mainstream. Most of the astronomers weren't using it until this ecosystem could be developed as a team effort between, all, you know, in some sense, everyone in this room and beyond. And it's that which the JWST data analysis tools are built on, this scientific Python ecosystem. Uh, and, and, and there's several different ways in which that plays out, as you'll see in just a little while. Uh, but it ends up meaning that this, this ecosystem that I'm, or that I'm showing you here from this great diagram by Jake Vanderplas um, is built of a lot of layers, um, all of which are touched by the JWST data analysis tools, but at different levels, right? Some of them, they're all, they're all used to a certain extent, but some are used much more than others. 
one of the most critical ones, of course, being the, the topmost layer, the, the AstroPy project. So now I'm channeling one of my other sides, right? Uh, I'm not actually going to spend a lot of time talking about AstroPy per se, though, because there's going to be a talk on Friday afternoon, I believe, by Brigida about this. So you should definitely go to that talk if you want to hear more about particularly infrastructure elements of AstroPy. Um, but I want to highlight here right now that, that it's a good example of how you can use the SciPy or the Scientific Python stack to uh, specialize in various science domains, right? That's sort of what the purpose it holds in some sense. And I've circled one particular feature AstroPy has to really highlight that, the AstroPy.time subpackage. The reason why that's a great example is because there's not very many communities that really need, like actually need date time measures good to nanoseconds over the lifetime of the universe, right? Like there's not actually a good reason for anybody other than astronomers to care about that particular time resolution. So it doesn't make sense for that to live in NumPy, for example, but it leverages wherever it can NumPy machinery, right? So there's the, the time is a good example of how it uses the NumPy machinery to sort of store things, but also rearranges them now and again to make sure we can maintain the precision we need for the specific scientific application of cosmology in most cases. So, and, and, and in the end, that's sort of one of the main purposes of AstroPy is to specialize the scientific Python stack so that tools like the JWST data analysis tools can focus on the JWST specific things and not have to spend a lot of time implementing a way of representing time that really should be shared across astronomy but not necessarily across everybody in this room. All right, so now I'm gonna jump in a little bit more into some of the specific data analysis tools that are being built for JWST. So the first one I wanna highlight is uh, the PhotoUtils package. So PhotoUtils is for photometry. So since many of you are astronomers, I should define that term. Uh, photometry is, uh, is the measuring of light, right? That's what that word means. But in, and, and it seems simple, right? You should just be able to look at an image, see how much light is in that star, and be done with it, right? That seems easy. Uh, no, it's not. It's by no means that easy. There are literally decades and decades of research on exactly how to measure the light from stars efficiently, effectively, and meaningfully in a way that you can actually interpret for astrophysics. Um, but there are a lot of well-known best practices in the field, and the whole point of photoutils is to sort of embody those best practices. Use wherever possible other layers of the Python scientific stack to sort of do the heavy lifting, you know, represent objects using, you know, NumPy arrays. We're looking at ways to make it work with Dask and that sort of thing. Uh, but when it's faced with the specific astronomical application of, I want to use JWST to measure how much light is in, you know, a million stars in this field, the astronomer shouldn't have to know all of that stuff. They should be able to say, I want to do a known photometry algorithm. And that's the essence of what PhotoUtils is trying to do. Right? I'm sort of showing you here some pretty pictures of examples of how that works. Um, but that's the core idea, is that it, it generalizes um, or sorry, it's, it makes more specific the general tools that this community builds and makes them applied to the, uh, the astronomical application so that JWST can then just tell people, use that tool with the JWST data. Um, another thing that's relevant here, though, is that um, oh, the video should be running here. Oh, there it's running. Uh, it, is that... Um, uh, PhotoUtils can also be used to, um, to do, why is that not playing here? Oh well, I can't pause it. Uh, it can be used to do uh, photometry on already existing data sets. So as I mentioned, the JWST mission has not launched yet, so that makes it very hard to, say, convince the astronomy community that they should learn how to use the data set or the, the tools for doing, um, uh, to, for analyzing JWST data. But in fact, these tools have been built with the idea that they can be used for existing data sets. Hubble is just one of many data sets like this that you could imagine using PhotoUtils for. And in fact, there is a wide and growing community, primarily of um, astronomers and astrophysicists, who use PhotoUtils for their own personal data sets, not even just space based data sets. Uh, so this is a way of taking a long-running mission and getting users long before you actually have data, which is in fact a great way to not spend 15 years building software that it turns out nobody wants to use. Um, so so that's, that's one of the core points of this model of development that I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. 
Uh, before leaving Photios, I do want to highlight, though, that it, 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 because it's been one of the earliest developed packages, it's also found some use outside of astronomy. And I'd certainly be interested in hearing from anyone in this room who's either encountered it or thought about use cases in the, of applying sort of astronomical algorithms to non-astronomy data sets. Like, for example, I've heard about people trying to identify tumors, right, bio or um, um, uh, neuroimaging using some of the algorithms that have been developed for astronomy. I know there was a project about doing colony counting in, in biology, again, using astronomy uh, photometric algorithms like the ones I was just talking about here. And there's probably others in the room here who have thought about this sort of thing. And I'd be really interested in hearing what you might have to say, say, over lunch or beers or something like that. Um, but. Having, having said that, let's move on to some of the additional data analysis tools. So the other, the other significant realm that most that uh, JWC does, and is really one of the things JWC brings to the table that that didn't exist as much before, is analysis of spectroscopy. Right, not just images, but also dispersed light of, in a, in the form of a spectrum. So for that, we're developing a package called Specutals, again, with the wider uh, astronomical community. Uh, and, and Specutals is not quite as developed now as uh, Photutals is, but it's following the same mold where we're trying to be very careful to develop data structures that are generic enough that other astronomy uh, applications can use them. So one of the key differences be between spectra and imaging is that spectroscopy has a wide range of different ways you can build spectrographs. They're all, they're all kind of special in their own unique ways in the way that an image, while well, they all have their quirks, an image is just a little bit simpler and with the data that just comes straight out of the detector. Um, and that ends up meaning there's a lot more ways, both on disk and just sort of conceptually in the researcher's mind, to represent spectra. So it's a much more complicated task to figure out one data structure that everybody can sort of map onto their mental model of a spectrum. But that is what Speculus is trying to do, and that's what this diagram essentially um, represents. So a big part of Speculus is just that. It's having a data structure that other libraries can plug into, some of which we might be developing, some of which random astronomers or non-astronomers might wish to develop. Um, but then the other half of it is uh, analysis functions. So again, this very same idea as was going on with the photutils package. The analysis functions are things that everybody sort of knows and has had 20, 30, 50 years of experience implementing in astronomy, uh, but don't exist in Python. Right, that, that have been re-implemented a dozen times and just need a canonical example where people are like, oh yeah, I trust that one, I'm just gonna use that instead of rolling my own. So it sort of pulls double duty there as both the data, the thing that represents the data and the thing that provides the sort of basic tools that astronomers know they need. Um, it's also a good example of, um, there it goes, it's also a good example of, oh. I don't know what's going on with the videos here. All right, let's see if it runs. Uh, a good example of that same concept I was saying before of applying these data sets or these, um, uh, these algorithms to other, um, to other data sets. So what this video should have been doing um, is showing you an example of applying this to a ground-based data set um, instead of a uh, space-based data set. I don't know why it's not running, but um, trust me, it would have been awesome. Uh, but anyway, the core point is the same thing I said before, that in the end, um, uh, these, these tools are getting users now rather than after the, the telescope launches so that we can get people to test them, give us feedback and explain, oh, this thing didn't make sense because, you know, you've been hanging out with the developers too much and I'm an astronomer. Or this thing, oh, great, actually those, those engineer, those software people know what they're doing. I guess we should do that, right? We get both of those kinds of feedback, but um, uh, we wouldn't get them if we weren't providing tools the astronomers need today. All right, hopefully this one's gonna play. Okay, good, something's happening there. Um, so uh, the other thing we've been working on more recently is building, in relevant to the tools uh, plenary session we just had in this room, uh, is building out visualization tools that work both in the notebook and as sort of standalone web apps. 
So astronomy is used to having sort of image viewer, interactive image viewers, like the kind of thing you're seeing playing here, as a, you know, a standalone QT, let's say, or in many cases, X Windows app, that they're just used to being able to load their data set up and like click on things. Um, but many of them are also happy with the idea of notebooks. So we're working to try to combine those concepts by building interactive data analysis tools that work with IPy widgets and some of the related stuff we've been all been hearing about and talking about today. Um, but then also providing versions of these tools that run um, as essentially desktop apps, right? Where you run some console command, the window pops up, it loads, and it looks like a desktop app, maybe Electron, maybe voila, but in practice, it's the same thing you would see in the notebook so that the users can easily transmit, transition from something that they're used to working with to uh, a more modern, if you like, workflow uh, that I probably don't need to sell most people in this room on. All right, uh, the other thing we've been using notebooks for that I think uh, is an interesting direction we're going is both as training tools, which should be sur a surprise to no one, that it's sort of easy to turn them into documentation for very specific scientific use cases, but also as testing tools, because we can use the notebooks we produce for specific science use cases to make sure we didn't accidentally break some important science use case by making a change to the code. So all the notebooks we're building as training tools are in CI, and they get run every so often so that we can know whether or not um, the analysis tools are affecting the scientific outcome. Um, but we're also showing them as um, nice rendered web pages so that people who aren't used to working in notebooks can at least see, here's how you would do it if you just want to type you know, in your IPython prompt or the like. Um, it, one last thing to say about that is that the, the next step that we're sort of developing a model for is something we're calling notebook-driven development, where instead we write the notebook before we write the code, right, in sort of analogy to test-driven development, where we have the scientists say, okay, here's what I would want my tool to do, and then they hand it off to the engineers who then spend some time implementing it, and then we sort of slowly iterate on it until we agree on, yes, this is the science use case. Um, so the reason why I'm talking all that is because um, it, it really embodies this philosophy that's behind all of these data analysis tools, uh, that it's supposed to be a toolbox. We can put all of these specialized and general tools together into one place, and then that way we don't have to do all of this data analysis any, any astronomer who wants to use GWST ever wa wanted uh, can imagine. Instead, we have to provide the sort of standard set of tools that they need to construct their own workflows, because they're going to do it anyway. As you saw, a third of them don't even believe they use anyone else's tools. So they're going to do their own thing. So we might as well give them pieces that let them imagine they're doing their own thing, when in reality, they're working on the shoulders of others. Uh, so then for the, just the last few minutes, I want to emphasize how this, how this development process works, because it, it's interesting, right? This is the confluence of three worlds that can be very challenging to work with at times because of what I'm sort of showing you here. So NASA is, and JWST is a very complicated thing, right? It's just hard to put stuff in space, so they have to have very complicated engineering practices and deliverables, and they're not just making it up, right? They have to do it to make this stuff work. But what this schedule is supposed to show you is simply that their schedules are very complicated, right? This is the top level schedule. Each of those rows also has a schedule at least this complicated, many of which have a third level of schedules at least this complicated. And all of the, and the data analysis tools are a little part of that that have to report back up to essentially NASA headquarters in the end and say, what progress are you making? By contrast, the academia, who are the sort of users of all of this, are driven by their very specific need of, I want to analyze this particular nebula in this particular way right now, and if you can't solve my problem, I'm going to do my own thing. And at the same time, of course, this room, the, the open source community, um, is much more driven to sort of experiment with new ways of doing development and um, new tools to sort of put, not push the edge of the physical sciences necessarily, but the edges of sort of the computational sciences, if you like. And these all have conflicting needs. So the question is, how do we, uh, how do we address that? And I'll just, I'll have to hurry here, but um, I'll just say very quickly what I think the key elements are. So we follow the open development model, which I think lots of people in this room are likely familiar with. The core point being um, 
that, that all, all contributions are in the open, done via pull requests whenever, uh, are done via pull requests and open to comment from the scientists in the community, right? So a scientist can come along and say, oh, you made this change to the code, that breaks my workflow for this reason. Then somebody who's a more engineering inclined person, maybe at Space Telescope, maybe somewhere else with technical expertise can say, oh, but you really need to do this other thing. You forgot about this thing. I know you really want your science to be this way, but there's this very specific technical problem that you probably haven't thought about because you're not trained in this stuff. So then the original author of the pull request, of course, is free to resolve these conflicts however they'd like. Um, and in the end, the maintainers of the project are the ones who merge it. Um, and that, that, that workflow enables this interaction to happen because it sort of separates at least the bottom two layers, right? It makes it so that the, the, the contributors on both levels can talk to each other. Um, I guess I've got to finish, wrap up here as quickly as I can. Uh, but the other important point here is that the planning happens in the same way, right? So that, that we try to make public wherever possible, here's the direction everything is going. It's not locked away in some filing cabinet that says beware the leopard um, deep inside space telescope, the planning for many of these things is in the GitHub repository. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have to do more sort of enterprise level, if you like, planning tools, like I'm showing you the JIRA here, but we've taken very careful efforts to um, hide that essentially from the scientists and in many cases the open source community users so that they don't have to be confused by that or lost and feel like it's not their world anymore. Um, so that's one of the key elements is sort of hiding that piece from them. Um, I should just skip over these things because there are many, many, uh, many of them repeat, but let me just emphasize one final thing here is that by doing things in this manner, um, it suddenly becomes possible for something that otherwise was mission specific, right, particular to JWST to become a community project. So what this ends up meaning is we can bring in a lot of other con collaborators from other large missions because something like AstroPy can be a neutral ground where they can all share following this model. Um, right, so I will not dwell on the conclusions I wanted to leave you with, but you can look at them and I thank you for your attention. Uh, we have a little time for questions. Uh, I have a mic here. I will run over to you. So if you have a question, please throw up a hand and I'll try and get over to you with the microphone. Hey, great talk. I want to ask, why do astronomers care about time down to the nanosecond over the lifetime of the universe? Uh, why do astronomers care about care to nanosecond? Uh, yeah, why do we have such strict requirements is what it amounts to. The, the core idea is that there are some things that happen over, um, so right, so the, the point is not that we actually need nanosecond precision d the whole lifetime of the universe. It's that some astronomers need nanosecond precision for like pulsars, for example, right, or much better than nanosecond precision in some cases. Um, and still over, you know, short, you know, year or sometimes century timescales because that's what they model. Um, and then other astronomers really need to go back to the beginning of the universe because that's what they study, right? What JWST is going to do is find the first stars in the universe. So they need to be able to represent things that far back. So to have a shared tool that's used by all parts of astronomy, you have to support both of those use cases. And that's just not possible if you sort of use any standard date time package that's out there. Any further questions? Oh. Hi, thanks. Uh, I'm assuming that the amount of data you're working with is very large. Do you have any challenges in transporting and storing the data? Um, so for JWST, the, ch the challenge is not so much that it's large, but that it's far away. So the, the term big data doesn't really apply in the sort of the way it's generally used in, in industry for JWST, because it's, they're relatively small detectors, right? They're, they're very high resolution, they, they show you very fine detail, but they're still, you know, 4K by 4K detectors is sort of typical. The problem is it's it's far away at the Lagrange point, you know, basically the, the point where the gravity of the sun and the earth cancel out, and that means you have to spend a lot of effort to send the data to the earth. 
And that's the real challenge for JWST, um, which there are a lot of technical elements about that that fortunately I don't have to worry about because it's dealt with on the engineering side. Uh, the next successor, though, is a completely different realm. It's called WFIRST, which is a much more big data project. And in fact, one of the big challenges we're working on right now is how to adapt some of these tools that were designed for something that's not as big data to, that is otherwise identical to make it work in big data. That's, for example, why I mentioned Dask in the first place. All right, let's thank Eric again.